the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations present The Pacific Story. In the midst of the fury of world conflict, events in the Pacific are taking on even greater importance. Here is the story of the Pacific and its peoples, whose destiny is at stake in the Pacific War. Here is the tale of the war in the Pacific and its meaning to us and to the generations to come. The Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, and dedicated to a fuller understanding of the vast Pacific Basin. This broadcast series comes to you as another public service, the drama of the past and present of the millions of people who live around the world's greatest sea, where the East at last meets the West. Indochina, the collapse of French empire in the Pacific. southeast corner of Asia is one of the most coveted regions in the world, Indochina. Here, France built her stronghold in the Far East and called it her balcony on the Pacific. Today, this strategic area, immensely wealthy in resources and commanding the riches of the Indies and the sea lanes in this quarter of the globe, is no longer French Indochina. Today, it is Japanese Indochina. For years, Japan had kept an eye on Indochina. In Tokyo, the Japanese military leaders stood around great maps on tables and studied the minutest details of the terrain, the shoreline, the harbors. Air bases here, General, would be of greatest strategic value to Japan. In uh, northern Tonking? Yes. We would then be in a position to bomb the economic and political basis of Jung Kai-shek government in Jung King. It would uh, also give us more effective bases against uh, Burma Road. And against British Burma and uh, Thailand. And here, control of this point would mean control of British communications between Hong Kong and Singapore. What is that, Admiral? Uh, Kamra Bay. Oh, yes. The new French naval base. Akamura Bay is one of the finest national harbors in the world. A Japanese fleet operating from this base could outflank the Philippines here, the British Malay States here, and the Netherlands Indies down here. What of the port of Saigon, Admiral? Just south of uh, Kamura Bay there. Uh, Saigon is more in size than Kamura Bay, but it is more important in a commercial sense. Then we should move to secure a dominant position in commerce at Saigon before the British can strengthen their defenses in the Pacific and before the United States can reinforce its uh, Asiatic fleet. Then uh, both Saigon and Kamenam Bay Admiral would be valuable in Japan's move to the south. They would be more than valuable, General. They are indispensable. Japan kept an eye not only on French Indochina, but likewise on the unfolding of events in the war in Europe after Hitler marched into Poland in 1939. By June 1940, when France collapsed, Japan was ready to move. The day after Marshal Pétain asked for an armistice, a Japanese spokesman made an important public pronouncement. The heavy traffic in arms from Indochina into China must stop. For the past five months... Heavy shipments have been made. Japan demands that the French government consent to the dispatch of Japanese inspectors to Indochina for the purpose of making investigations of all goods going into China. If this traffic is not stopped, the Japanese army will wean Indochina from hostility to Japan. Well, they move very fast, Mon General. Hey, I've been waiting for this. Here is the report, sir. Yes, let me see. 
The Japanese have now established inspection control stations at all our key points on the highways and railroads leading into China. Uh-huh. Incredible. They have taken 100,000 tons of Chinese supplies at Haiphong alone. Yes. And you see on the report there, that included 400 tons of medical supplies. Yes. And down there on the bottom, sir, you see there is a total amount stopped and taken by the Japanese. Uh, 150,000 tons of what they call war materials, including 2,200 motor trucks. Is there nothing we can do? Yes. Table of this country, monsieur. Merci. Hmm. The Japanese mission that came to Indochina to seal the frontier to China now demands that it be opened for the Japanese army. Is there any answer to the cable, monsieur? No. No answer is necessary. <laughs> Standing against the pressure of Japan was Governor General Georges Coutreau, then as today, a supporter of the de Gaulle Committee. But within a week after the collapse of France, the Pétain regime ordered the removal of Coutreau, sent Vice Admiral Jean Ducoup to replace him. For more than a month, Coutreau held on. It is a very difficult situation with Admiral Ducoup here and General Coutreau not stepping down from authority. Well, whom are we to obey? They say General Catru is looking to the British for help. Oh, but the British cannot help him now. Perhaps not. No. They have closed the Burma Road three days ago to appease Japan. Perhaps General Catru believes that there might be some change in the international scene so that London can support him. If that should happen, he would be able to defy Vichy. <sighs> Such a complicated state of affairs. Yes. He said that in... Have you seen the new order? Order? What order? That well, the coup has taken over. He is now governor general. But what of General Catro? He is gone. Gone? Gone where? Who knows? But it would be my guess that he has taken the only course that... The... General Catro made a dramatic escape from Indochina, went first to London and then to Egypt to continue his fight with the fighting French. And now Indochina moved step by step into the camp of the Japanese. The Japanese have demanded and taken air bases at Laokai and Hanoi. Japanese troops crossed the border into Indochina at three important points just before midnight. The Japanese have captured a French general and 2,000 troops and forced the French to withdraw. The Japanese have secured a monopoly on Indochina's rice, rubber, and coal. This comes as a lifesaver for Japan, whose rice supply was dangerously reduced by the war. Step by step, Japan engulfed Indochina. In Hanoi... Admiral Deku, the French Governor General, sat in conference with Japanese Major General Raishiro Sumita, discussing these progressive steps. In Vichy, the loudspeakers announced, After long conferences, Japan and Vichy are now in complete accord and will cooperate in the defense of Indochina. Meanwhile, Frenchmen stood on the shore of Saigon and Cameron Bay and watched Japanese men of war and transports move into the great harbors. Japanese warships in Cameron Bay. France has lost in the Pacific. Not only France. From this naval base and the one at Saigon, the Japanese fleet is now in a position to cut the British sea route from Hong Kong to Singapore and to intercept all fleet movements between Manila and Singapore. Well, they may even sail into Singapore itself one day. We are seeing more than Japanese warships here. We are seeing the drawing of a new map of Southeast Asia. French rule in Indochina came to a close in 1941, marking the end of 80 years of colonial effort. In these same waters where Japanese ships bristling with guns now moved, French warships unlimited their guns in 1858. The decks are cleared for action. All guns are loaded, Admiral de Genoyer. Very well, Captain. Has any word come from ashore? No word yet, sir. The time of the ultimatum is now past, is it not? More than an hour has passed, sir. We will wait until the Spanish ships are in position. Yes, sir. Certainly the commander of the Annonite forces in force ashore at Tournai must know that he cannot prevail against a combined French and Spanish fleet. 
It is my opinion, sir, that neither the Annamite government at way nor the commander of these forts takes our ultimatum seriously. Uh, they will know we are in dead earnest this time. We have protested the treatment of our missionaries again and again. But each time the fleet has sailed away, they have renewed their persecutions. Well, the Spanish crown has protested the death of missionaries as often as we have. Our mistake has been that we have done no more than protest. Uh, Admiral, yes? Admiral uh, the Admiral of the Spanish fleet has signaled that he is in position and ready to fire. Uh, Captain. Yes, sir. Is there any trace of a boat coming out of this flagship? None, sir. Very well. Lieutenant, signal the Spanish Admiral to open fire whenever he's ready. And Captain? Yes, sir. Give the order. Open fire. Yes, sir. Fire guns ready. Fire! <laughs> On the first salvo. Continue firing until the forts are demolished. Yes, sir. Ready? Fire! From this time forward, for a period of nearly 20 years, French admirals were to have the ruling hand in extending the influence of France into Indochina. Where they were able to impose their will by force of arms, they prevailed. But when they found it necessary to remove force from one place and apply it at another, outbreaks resulted. This is the tenth month we have been besieged. Mm, ten months, yes. Help is coming. The courier said Admiral Chanet is coming with a strong force of 3,000 men. Ah, 3,000 men. There are 12,000 animites outside the citadel. Admiral Chanet's men were not even get close to the citadel. But the courier, the two, uh, barely with his life. Admiral Chanet and his 3,000 men will be slaughtered before they get here. That is not true, which... What is that? On guard! That must be Admiral Shani's force. Maybe the animals are attacking again. On guard! To the fighting flag! Everyone to fighting for the chance. It is Admiral Shani's men. Yeah, they are coming to the Anamites. Watch your fire. Do not shoot Admiral Shani's men. The Anamites are trapped between the Admiral's force and the Citadel. The Anamites are trapped. The Admiral is going to lift the siege. He's going to lift the siege. Open the Citadel gates. We will turn on the right shaft. Through this victory, Admiral Charnay forced through a treaty with Anam and won three Cochin China provinces and a money indemnity for France. France was gaining a foothold in Southeast Asia. Now, French traders were making inroads far beyond the limits agreed upon between France and Anam. The friction that had subsided grew again, and another French admiral, Admiral Dupre, then Governor General of Cochin China, sent for a brilliant young officer, Francis Gagné. Oh. Uh, come in, Monsieur Garnier. This must be important, Admiral Dupre, to bring me all the way from Shanghai down here to Saigon. Oui, it is. Your work of exploration can be done at any time. You mean, Admiral, that what you have in mind must be done at once? Oui, immediately. Recently, Jean Dupuy, a French trader, sailed up the Red River. He proved the navigability of the Red River to China's southern provinces. He went all the way up to Yunnan. That was contrary to France's treaty with Anam, was it not? Mm, our treaty makers were not far-sighted enough. Mm. Uh, what do you wish now, Admiral Dupre? Alors, in order to reach China's southern provinces, we must go through Tonkin. As you perhaps know, there is now widespread revolt in Tonkin against the government at Hue. You wish to move into Tonkin? If France does not, Britain may intervene. And if Britain should gain control of Tonkin... Britain would hold the key to South China and would endanger our position on the peninsula. Hello. I will outfit an armed expedition for you, Gary. I will lead no such expedition. Or oh, you are against France taking Tonkin? I am against taking it by force. Sure. Uh, what do you propose? The capital at Hue is insecure. I believe it will yield without resorting to force. You must have a show of force. A small number of troops, perhaps. How many? Oh, 200, perhaps. Not more. 200? Oh, that is not enough to take any sort of a stand against the opposition. With 200 French soldiers and a few Anamites, young Francis Gagné set sail for Hanoi. He found Hanoi buzzing with military preparations to close the Red River to commerce and to resist the French forces. Take this ultimatum to the commander of the Anamite forces in Hanoi. Inform him that if the Red River is not immediately open to commerce and Hanoi disarmed, that I will storm the citadel. The ultimatum went unheeded. Francis Gagné attacked. With 
French soldier, Garnier, took the citadel. Envoys from Huey came to the citadel to make peace. Gentlemen, France wishes peace with an army. Our immediate problem now is not the Anamites, but the Chinese bandits, the Black Flag. The Black Flag are troubling you here, yes? We have information, gentlemen, that your government at Huey has encouraged these bandits against France. Oh, the Black Flag are strong. We have protested and asked the Cantonese government to send regular Chinese troops to halt them. But the Chinese regulars have joined with the bandits. We are as helpless before the bandits are you. Could it be that your government at Huey prefers the black flags to the French in the control of Tonkin? Monsieur Garnier! Monsieur Garnier! What is it, Lieutenant? The black flag. The bandits are marching on Hanoi. Our patrols are trying to hold them at the paper bridge. At the paper bridge? Yes, sir. They are attacking in force. Sound assembly. We will march at once. Is the paper bridge ahead of us, sir? Yes. Very well. You take the left flank, and you, Lieutenant, take the right. I will take the center. We will charge the main body of the bandits at the bridge. Forward! Charge! Drive them back from the bridge! Charge! Right, Sir John! Slow down! Monsieur Garnier! Black flags were driven back, but the death of Francis Garnier delayed the French conquest of Tonkin ten years. Then France sent Commandant Henri Rivier to establish a protectorate over Annam. But Rivier was killed by the black flags at almost the same spot and in almost the way that Garnier was killed. France then bombarded the fort at Way, the capital, forced the Annamites to sue for peace, and completed the conquest of the Delta by taking the towns one by one. Then France was to sow the seeds of trouble, which was to harass her for the next 40 years and more. A period of conquest is over. The rule of the admirals has come to an end. Now, we must substitute civil administration. Monsieur, my committee has a study, and it is our conclusion that we must form the colonies in our own image in order to better them. Hmm. In uh, what sense does the senator mean? We must replace the native institutions with our institutions in France. Hmm. Well, it might be distinctly to our advantage to retain some of the native institutions. No. No, I do not agree with you. You feel, monsieur, that the natives are not capable of contributing to French culture? We must lead the natives from their darkness to the light of French culture. Uh, yes. And we must start by substituting the French language for their language. Oblige the natives to learn French in place of their own language? Precisely. My committee is of the opinion that when the natives have learned to speak French, they will then eagerly seek the wisdom of French ideas and will be more interested in the products of French manufacture. Yeah, this will not work. No. We believe it will work. The only way to eliminate the difference in thinking between the French and the natives is to replace the native institutions and education with ours. Monsieur... On the basis of our study, I propose that we submit a resolution to provide the French education. The seeds were sown, and under the surface, while the French sought to entrench themselves more deeply in Southeast Asia, the Indo-Chinese grew restive. An underground wave of nationalism swept through the land. The French themselves fought for liberty, equality, and fraternity. But the Frenchmen who fought for liberty, equality, and fraternity are not the same Frenchmen who are here ruling us. Japan has shown what a small nation can do. It has defeated Russia. Yes, and we can do the same. And the Chinese under Sun Yat-sen, they are organizing to rebel against the Manchus. If we yield, we shall have nothing. We shall be crushed. If we fight, we shall have at least our honor. And we may save our nation. In 1908, the Annamites revolted against the French for the first time. The outbreak was put down. 
But under the surface, it continued to smolder. When World War I broke out, more than 100,000 Indo-Chinese were recruited. Pull up the gangway! All right! Lift the gangway! Easy now, easy! Pull out! Take away! Take away! Take away. So, they are really going to take us away from our homes. Yes, the ship is all loaded. We are sailing. Will they really take us to France to fight on the battlefields? I do not know. They call us volunteers. Volunteers? They herded us together like miserable animals and took us aboard the ship under guard like prisoners. Where are we going? Uh, I do not know. Let us ask his French officer. Yes. Where are you taking all of us? You will learn in due time. But where? We are sailing. That is all I can tell you now. You will be told what to do when the time comes. They are taking us to France, I know. They have taken me away from my family. I am not going. I am not going. Where are you going? You cannot climb over that rail. Come back. Come back. Come back. Man overboard. Man overboard. Get that man. Get him. Indo-Chinese volunteers distinguished themselves on the battlefields of France, but those who came back returned to conditions little better than those they had left. To fight for their rights, various political parties took form. The Nationalist Annamite Party, much like the Chinese Guomindong, a communist party, and several lesser parties. In secret places, they prepared arms and ammunition. Some of their money for operation was secured by outright banditry, now and again, accidental explosions of bombs drew attention to them. The police hunted them down, but they continued to operate underground and to prepare for the day when they would strike. Native soldiers gasped at Yen Fei, mutinied at dawn today, and brutally murdered their French officers. Yen Fei controls the Red River Valley and is of great strategic importance. Rebellion is spread to Hanoi. Bombs have been thrown at the commissariat. A sub-prefect has been assassinated, and violence is rife throughout the city. Widespread arrests are taking place in Indochina in the face of the native outbreak. Several thousand natives have been jailed, as the authorities are struggling to get the upper hand. It is... Uh time that we re-examine our policy toward the institutions of the people of Indochina. Well, we might better set up a policy of association with the people of Indochina rather than to try to continue to impose the French language and the French culture upon them, huh? And what do you suggest, Mr. Chairman? That, uh, that we govern the natives by operating through framework of their own laws and customs. That would mean their relaxation? Of the teaching of French. Well, we should have learned by this time that the wise course is to put the emphasis in primary education on the vernacular rather than on the French language. With this policy... With this policy, the French and the peoples of Indochina drew closer together. The French, through their extensive research, uncovered the wonders of the cultural heritage of Indochina. The Indochinese recognized the great value of the French doctors in the fighting of tropical diseases. But the intellectuals of Indochina still doubted that the French liberté, égalité, and fraternité applied to them. This failure to see eye to eye was an important factor after the outbreak of the war in the Pacific. There is another squadron of planes, Mon General. Yes. Thailand planes, are they not? Uh, yes, sir. They are violating our borders without regard for our rights. Thailand knows that Japan is putting pressure on us. I think Japan is using Thailand against us. Uh, this is an old quarrel with Thailand. They are teaching their school children that parts of Indochina belong to them. And Thailand is building up our armed forces day by day. Yes, and we have only 27,000 regular troops. And Thailand has at least 60,000. And many reserves, a growing air force, navy. Air force? I am certain Thailand is getting planes from Japan. Mm, we can do nothing about that. Well, General, if they outnumber us, we must get reinforcements. Reinforcements? Reinforcements would have to come from France itself, or from other parts of the French Empire. This is impossible now. Are we to have nothing to fight with? Below us, there in Camera Bay, 
We have the crews of Ramon Piquet. Four dispatch boats and ten gunboats. Uh, that is little out here in the Far East alone. Uh, we must use what we have and make every move count. General, there are some more talent planes. Yes. One of these days, they will do more than simply fly over us. We must make every effort. The friction increased between the two neighbors, Indochina China, and Thailand. Charges continued that Japan was fomenting the conflict. Developments came rapidly. Last night, Thailand troops attempted to cross the Katsum River and seize the Cambodian village of Popier. The surprise attack was thrown back by... The... Japan has sold 25 bombers and 33 pursuit planes to Thailand. Violations of the border continue as... All commercial operations on land between Thailand and French Indochina have been suspended. Observers say that the two nations are moving toward a full dress war. The French Asiatic squadron, led by the cruiser La Motte Piquet, last night destroyed the main units of the Navy of Thailand in a surprise attack in the Gulf of Payam. Japan dictates that the strife between Thailand and Indochina come to an end. Thailand's claims are just. Japan will mediate this border dispute and will make the final decision. The French were in no position to defend their claims. France had fallen, and Indochina, isolated and alone, halfway around the world in the Far East, was caught between Thailand and the Japanese. The French yielded. We have ceded to Thailand territory amounting to 25,000 square miles, with a population of a million people. But let it be known that we yielded to Japan, not to Thailand. And Japan it was that was calling the tune. When the settlement was made, Foreign Minister Matsuoka dispatched a letter to both Indochina and Thailand. Japan expects France and Thailand to declare that they have no intention to conclude with any third powers any agreement or understanding that anticipates military or any other type of cooperation against Japan. This was the beginning of the end of France in Southeast Asia. And the end itself was not far off. Presently, Japan moved into Indochina itself, then struck at the United States at Pearl Harbor. Thailand then joined forces with Japan and Indochina. France's balcony on the Pacific dropped like a ripe plum into the lap of the Japanese. With the taking of Indochina, Japan gained not only strategic control of the sea lanes of Southeast Asia and the riches of the Indies, but also of Indochina's own vast resources. For Indochina, with its 286,000 square miles, one-third larger than France itself, is rich in its own resources. Possession of these brings Japan a great stride closer to its objective of self-sufficiency and gives Japan a stronger position against all the powers of the world. been listening to The Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations as a public service to clarify events in the Pacific and to make understandable the cross-currents of life in the Pacific Basin. A reprint of this Pacific Story program is available at the cost of 10 cents. Send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. The address again University of California Press, Berkeley, California. The Pacific Story is written by Arnold Marquis. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Thomas Peluso. Your narrator, Gaines Whitman. The Civic Story was presented from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.